I started really uh, playing um, with the Salford Schoolboys team. Most boys in Salford really were, uni were United fans anyway. Almost it was a Salford thing where it's, you would go over to Hume, Moss side, Levens, and that was the, the, men, the city side of the city. But um, when I played for the Salford Schoolboys team, I got a letter, which I've always kept in my studio, um, from, well, it was my father got it, from Louis Rocker. And you know, I got into the Slade School when I was 17 years old, which was, I was the youngest boy ever to go there. And the Slade School is the most difficult school to get into. It's the top art school in Britain. And they take only 30 from about 10,000 people. But my father carried this letter with him in his pocket, in his wallet, almost till the day he died. It was infinitely more important to him than getting the sleigh. And it was from Louis Rocker. It's the kind of letter that all the Busby babes would have got. And uh, as you can see, it's from the Manchester United uh, notepaper, and it says to Mr. Harold Riley, Dear Sir, having heard of your son playing with Salford schoolboys and keen on the game, I would be much obliged if you would let the boy come along when convenient and have some games with our juniors. I can assure you he would be well cared for here. The main reason for my writing, you may well be aware, is that we are keen here to foster the local boys. Yours faithfully, Louis Rocker. Now that's the kind of letter that all the babes would have got and many players, of course, who came and played with United would have got. So Rocker went to see my father and they agreed. And the thing is that he was a huge influence in the club at that time um, because he'd actually been with the club since its beginnings at Newton Heath. He'd given it the name. He was responsible for the, uh, for the name of Manchester United. And also, he was the man who went to Liverpool and brought man back, he suggested to the board. And the policy of young players was really a brought about largely through Louis Rocker. I went down and they played with the juniors and the, it, was, uh, it was a wonderful time. There was such an enthusiasm for football in the city. But then, of course, I played for two seasons. I could never get into the team because of Duncan Edwards, because he was the greatest player I ever saw. And um, so I couldn't get in the team regularly, but I played with them and trained with them. And eventually I went to London to the Slade School. So I had to train with Chelsea, which that arrangement was made. And, um, and then I came out and played at the weekends. But in the end, I, th I think I felt I was actually more likely to be more successful with my hands than my feet. And my family were all artisans. They were all painters and musicians. So I stopped playing. And what was it like under the tutelage of the likes of Bert Wally, Jimmy Murphy? You must have learned a lot there. Well, yes. I mean, what you, what you found uh, with them was that what they fostered was a family feeling. You felt that they were taking you in, you know. Um, and uh, they were people that, in a sense, were, were homely people, you know. It's, it's curious because I'm thinking about nowadays and then i mean not so long and just before he finished bill shankly at liverpool i went to make a drawing of him and he was sitting with a little desk it was like almost like a toy desk and he was sitting there and he said just a minute son he said i just have to finish this and he was writing letters to the fans he was writing letters in his own hand and sending christmas cards and i thought well, that's another era, really. It's not like football is now, nowadays. But what was the same was that when you had somebody in the position that, that Sir Matt was in as a kind of figurehead, a father figure, you felt this family thing right down. And that's what Shankly had at Liverpool. Because all the people at that time felt that you, as a player or a developing player, were part of the family and the crowd were part of that too because it was a club. You were all part of the same thing. But what they did feel, what Bert Wally, who was, was such a nice man, what they really in fact did was that they looked after you. You felt as if you were special because you were part of it really. And people mentioned them as some really special coaches. What, what, what skills did they give you to make you into these fantastic professionals? 
but Wally was a, was a wonderful coach in terms of making you feel the whole field. You know, he'd say, you've, you're not watching. You've got to see the periphery around you. And I always remember him with Duncan Edwards on one occasion saying to Duncan, because Duncan had this fantastic ability to see the field. Some pit players don't have peripheral vision. They see it like that, you know. There are some players now, you can see them, they just see in front of them. And when they turn around, it's like that. But they wanted all the field. And that meant that the longer ball that was given, you see, the, the use of the long ball was by having only the ability to see where it was going to go. And um, Wally was, was wonderful. And Murphy was really a much, Murphy was much more uh, uh, a character builder. I always remember Jimmy Murphy talking about comradeship, that really, in fact, you know, if you were, if your players were your comrades, you were much more likely to actually feel and react with them than if they were just another player being paid to be there. And they, were, they instilled that kind of thing, really. And that, of course, you saw, I saw the development of players within that group. Um, I saw them really emerging, uh, their abilities emerging. And as time went on and they were playing in the first team, the maturity of those players that came about, really. I mean, Coleman, Eddie Coleman, for instance, was a wonderful. I mean, he would have loved to play now because he was a ballet dancer with the ball, really. He jinked a lot. And I, he played a bit of rugby league, I remember. And so he always had this shoulder switch as if he was giving the ball. But he'd switch the ball and switch his shoulders and body that way and he'd go the other way. And, um, but that's a natural ability he had with that. Now you mentioned Duncan Edwards' vision there. What other aspects of his, of his skill base made him such a fantastic player? Not just his vision, he had everything, didn't he? He did have everything. Um, he had everything that I think it was possible for a footballer to have, uh, apart from long life, let's say that. Um, I, remember I, st I remember I went to see them play just before um, they went to Belgrade, when they played Arsenal in that momentous match. And I was standing on the touchline, on the, in the crowd for that match, and I saw the boys afterwards. And they were in good spirits going out to Belgrade and joked about why didn't you come with us kind of thing. Um, but Duncan Edwards at that moment was approaching a very high peak in his performance level. See, when you have a player like Duncan Edwards in your team, he can make the whole team do things because he had huge charisma. His charisma spread around the and you felt when you were playing, if he was with you, you know, you, you were part of a powerful entity. If you took him away, you actually took away, as it were, almost a large part of your energy. He was immensely powerful. That was the first obvious thing about him. He could get up very high and head them away. But he also had great um, rhythm great rhythm with the ball so he could actually he had great ball control he had an incredible change of pace he was totally fearless completely fearless and he had an you see the one thing you cannot teach in a footballer you can't teach instinct instinct is what people call great talent really i mean you can teach someone to have everything to have ball control you can teach them to be very fit but you can't teach instinct because you don't know how it happens. He was very down to earth, really. He, he didn't have any edge with him. He didn't miss very much, but he took things very much for granted. Um, I wasn't, because he was my rival, as it were, in the, in the t I didn't, um, I didn't pal out with Duncan as much as I did with Eddie Coleman or Jeff Bent or some of the other players. But of course, we, we were friends. And I remember him saying to him the last time I played in the training ground, I said, I'm not going to be able to come anymore, Duncan. And he said, why not? So I said, <laughs> because people underestimated his ability. You know, they thought he was just a big, big lad, but he was all there. And I said, well, I've really got to get on with my painting now. You know, and uh, I said, really, the thing is that, you know, I'm, I'm probably... Uh, 
I'm probably better with my hands than I am with my feet, you see. So he, and I always remember him looking at me and, and saying, well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> that was that. You know, he took life exa exactly as it was. And uh, I, I said to him on one occasion, uh, we were talking about players and, and what have you. And um, I remember him saying to me that uh, as far as he was concerned, the most important thing wasn't winning. It wasn't winning, he said. The most important thing is you do your best, you see. And I always thought that was a simple thing to say, but it's very important that the basis at the end of the day is a sport. And if, if the basis is only to win, that becomes really in a way linked with money and commercial things. But he was a sportsman. He actually loved. If you hadn't paid him, he would have played because he loved football. They did start winning in 56 with the first title. You must have been delighted when you saw them bring that home. We've, oh, yeah, absolutely, yeah. Because prior to that, of course, what Matt was doing was he was introducing the players in slowly. I remember I got a game once uh, with Jack Rowley. And, and Jack Rowley, and behind me was, um, was Johnny Carey. You know, in the history of Manchester United, there are certain players that you could build a team around. They're like pillars. Some players are great. They're wonderful players, wonderful exponents, but you need to put them in a team, like Cantona. Cantona was terrific in a winning team, but you couldn't build a team around Cantona. You could build a team around Johnny Carey. You could build a team around Duncan Edwards. You could build a team around Brian Robson. You could build a team around Beth Lawn Charlton if you had him in the same team, and you could build a team around Roy Keane. But the thing is that there are certain players that you can do that with. Now, Jack Rowley, when I was playing uh, with him, Stan Pearson was, in, was the inside forward, Jack Rowley was the centre forward. But Matt kept bringing players in and letting them, the young boys go in and play for the experience of playing. But when you finally saw that what was taking over was the younger players were the predominant force in the team, in 56, you knew it was coming. You could feel it. And, of course, that swept everybody up. You know, everybody in the city at that time. In 57, I remember going to see Billy Meredith. And Billy Meredith had come and sat in the corner of the... Uh, so when Sofa Boys played at the cliff, we played in the training ground. He used to come, when they played Manchester Boys, to sit in the corner and watch the and talk to the lads. He was such a hugely legendary person, um, but he, he filled you with a feeling of pride because he'd played for Manchester United and City, you know, 870 odd times. But he made you feel proud to be from this part of the world. Well, in 56, when the Busby Bades started to emerge and they won the championship, if you like, what happened with then was that everybody in this neck of the woods that was a Manchester United supporter felt with them. They felt elevated. It wasn't just the team that had won the cup. Everybody won it. And so that's what football does. It lifts you up. You know, on a dark, rainy day, when people have finished work and they've worked maybe all night, they go and stand in the ground. And if you win, you're elevated. You're lifted up. And that's what happened in this part of the world when the, and then the respect for them grew everywhere. Because when they went to play in Europe, um, I remember the um, eventful game when Bill Folkes scored that uh, momentous goal, you know, against Real Madrid. I was actually was there. Um, you just felt proud to be part of, of the whole scene, really. And then on the 6th of February, obviously, it was the terrible event. How did you hear the very bad I news? was on a bus in Oxford Street in London. And I saw a hoarding, Manchester United players, and killed. And I immediately got up. The bus was between Oxford Circus and Tottenham Court Road. And I got up and I decked off the bus and went back to the first newsstand and read it. And I was mm, not just horrified, I was stunned. Um, the, the whole... Um, the whole aura that one has about life and people in it that mean something to you 
and what you identify with in life is very important. You see that in painting very often. When you paint somebody's portrait, the aura of their life isn't just themselves, it's the things around them. And the aura of my life at that time, even though I'd given up playing the football, the aura of my was still with the Busby Bay, still with the team. And it was um, shattered, really. Did you have any concerns about the future of Manchester United, at least short term? Yes, yes you do, because you're confused. You don't really know what's going to happen. Um, and you think to yourself, uh, well, what can they do? How can they cope with that? But you do. Life takes you on. You have to do. And that's what happened with um, the disaster. You think to yourself, who can play now? But players were found. And I know Harry and, um, and Bill came back and they played pretty quickly. They're wonderful players, that were, they were both of them. And um, I think, in a sense, the survivors, the story of the survivors, is absolutely fascinating because they were alive. The story of those who died had been completed. But those who, who you know, you wondered how they would get on and how they would recover. It must have taken a bravery in their own right, really, just to carry on playing, mustn't it? Oh, unquestionably, yes, yes. I mean, certainly Harry Gregg and Bill F Folks were very brave men. I mean, but actually, if you know them personally, you know they are brave men, yeah. You were obviously friends with Samat Busby. Did he ever speak to you about the team, maybe the disaster itself? Yes. Um, I do remember on one occasion sitting with him at a match, and he, he said something to me about, I said to him, gosh, I'm, I'm looking, that's a, that was a good result, that. I just, you know, I sometimes wonder um, about what would have happened in the long run with the best. And he looked, turned to me and he said, I wonder so often how it would have been said, if they could have gone on, yes, he said, we wonder how it could have been, he said, and that's the tragedy, isn't it? I remember making a drawing of him um, as he was sitting in the stand, and I could feel, could feel his sadness, because he looked down at the pitch, and he could see the shadows of those boys running. I go to Old Trafford now, and they kindly allow me to sit on the touchline and draw, so I'm near to the play. And I so often see the shadow of those boys coming across. I see Duncan Edwards chinking to the... He had a wonderful habit of, of going closer to the touchline than people thought they could go and go around them. And then I, I would look across and I would see Duncan, because one of the great things about Duncan Edwards was the way he would burst through. And, um, and Bobby, although I didn't play with Bobby, Bobby came a little later, but the flowing nature of the way Bobby ran, the soaring, graceful way that Tommy Taylor would rise. I mean, he, he, he rose from the ground to head a ball like nobody I'd ever seen go up before. And it's, it's curious, you know, Roger, Roger Byrne had such a, he had such a, a wonderful marshalling effect upon the team. He was, you know, the, f the strange thing is that when you, you are playing in a football team and it's a team game, and I can't speak of the professional footballer because I'm not, I'm an artist. But when you, when you play with players of that caliber, who were much greater than I could ever have been, but I remember thinking the camaraderie that exists between them is one thing, but they need someone they all have respect for, that they will actually listen to. And Roger Byrne was that person, really. You know, if you were playing cards on the train and what have you, you would look up and you'd find that, that uh, he'd be there watching, sort of thing, and you were aware of his presence all the time. How would you ass assess the achievements of the team that lost their lives? <sighs> well, you know, uh, the assessment it can be made in numbers. It can be made in how many. It's like thinking that, you know, how good a fighter is in terms of the number of wins, the number of draws. It wasn't really like that. I think the assessment that you have to make about the Busby Bay is, 
is that they occurred at a moment when British football went through a huge change. The defeat in 54 by the Hungarians had revealed that we were not actually um, the best in the world and we had fallen behind tactically um, and in, certainly in, in the, the way people were controlling the ball. And I think that the emergence of the babes at that time gave the whole of Britain a sense of uh, assurance that we could catch up. I've always loved the club and those days with the Busby Babes were some of the great joys of my life. Yeah.